Hello, this is Prophetess Dr. Sandra Ingram with the Rebuilding the Walls Ministry. So glad you have decided to join us on today. We pray that you will be blessed and we want you to know that we praise the Lord, we magnify him, we edify him for his goodness and his mercy and his grace. And it is what we do to worship God and get to give him praise, honor, and glory. So we pray that something will be said today that will help you make it through the next week, the month, or the next year. Right now, we will have our scripture by Elder Michael Ingram, a prayer, and a song. And after that, we will get into the word that the Lord has for today. Good morning and God bless you. We will be reading from the 28th chapter of Genesis, verses one through five, and then picking up again at verses 10 through 15. Genesis 28, one, then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him, you shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Arise and go to Paddan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take yourself a wife from there, of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may be an assembly of peoples and give you the blessing of Abraham to you and to your descendants with you, that you may inherit the land in which you are a stranger, which God gave to Abraham. So Isaac sent Jacob away and he went to Paddan Aram to Laban, the son of Bethuel, the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob and Esau. Then picking up at the 10th verse, now Jacob went out from Beersheba and toward Haran. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head and he lay down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. God bless the red word. Let us pray. God our Father, everlasting Father, the King of Kings, God Almighty, we come before you in the name of Jesus, humbling ourselves, God, because we recognize how great you are, how excellent your name is. So we take this time first to praise you for who you are and to thank you for the privilege of being able to come into your presence. So God, as we're here, we want to ask that you bless us, your people. First of all, forgive us for our sins, cleanse us from every unrighteousness, make us worthy to be your vessels. And thank God you have made provision for that to happen. We thank you for the price that Jesus paid for us on the cross. 
Now, God, as we look at the state of this world today, we're asking you that you would come in, have mercy. You've shown mercy over the years, God, over the decades, over the millennia. You have shown mercy to men. We're asking for mercy one more time, God. We're asking that you reach out, touch the body of Christ, draw our hearts and our minds in so that we can stand as priests and kings on this earth representing you and making intercession for humanity, for the earth in general. Help us, God, move in your people, God. Stir up revival, reach out, touch hearts and minds. Heal broken hearts, God. Deliver bound spirits and souls, God. Move for your people in the name of Jesus. Any who may view this video, God, touch. Touch, let them feel your presence and know that you are God and that you love us and care for us. Bless and keep us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Be not dismayed, whatever be tired, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day or all the way he will take care of you god will take care of you no matter what may be the test God will take care of you. Lean, weary one upon his breast. God will take care of you. God. Take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will take care of you. Amen. Amen. To God be the glory. Yes, he will. God will take care of you. This morning, we're going to be speaking from God won't leave you. And the sub title is, if you don't feel close to God, guess who moved? It won't be God, but he will never leave you or forsake you. And remember in um, Genesis 28 and 15 says, and we're going to talk about this more, and behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places, whether thou goest and will bring thee again and to the land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken of. There's a lots of promises in this verse. And I want to tell you, it's just not for the Old Testament. It is for us today. He said, I'm with you. I'll keep you. I don't care where you go. I'm going to be there for you. If you slip and fall, I'll be there. When you get up, 
I'll be there. And because some of us, you may be in your land of promise and have to leave out for a reason. But if that happens, understand this, God will bring you back because he said, I won't leave you until I've done that which I have spoken of about you and bring you into your land of promise. So remember the Israel Israelites, when they left Egypt, they had some good news all the way back then. In the Old Testament, when we look at Exodus 3, 1 through 8, and this is the scripture where Moses has, he's been brought up, he's been raised uh, with the king of Egypt, he's killed a man, and now he's had to flee. And he's in this field, and he's looking at the burning bush. So let's see what happens in Exodus 3 and 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro his father-in-law, the priest of the Midden, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush and looked and behold, the bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush has not burned. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. And he said, draw nigh hither, put off your shoes from thy feet, for the place wherein thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt. But here's coming the good news. God sees you, number one. And I have heard their cry. God hears you. And by reason of their taskmasters, I know their sorrow. God know what you're going through. That's why he's going to never leave you, nor must forsake you. No matter what you do, he's going to be there for you, but, but please be rest and assured that you can beat him. I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land unto a good land and a large unto a land flowing with milk and honey unto the places of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Prezerites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. So remember, even before when God, Abraham knew all the people that was going to be in the land when God promised them Canaan. Canaan wasn't empty. It had a whole lot of people in it. But God was telling them it was your. So when you get to your land, it may have a lot of obstacles in it. And it may have a lot of people in it. And you might be saying, why God have me come over here? It's no place for me. But when God calls you to go to a place, he has defeated your enemies. That's what he was telling them. So when they got ready to go in the, in the promised land, that's why it wasn't any need to say, oh, we can't go. It's giants in the land. They already knew. But you know, we have to learn to trust God and to understand really in our hearts that God will never leave you or forsake you, no matter what the enemy says, no matter what the enemy does, no matter how many people talk about you, how many, no matter how many people tear you down, no matter if your family turn their back, you, it doesn't matter. 
God will never leave you or forsake you. So in that verse, remember, this is some good news. God sees you. He hears you. He delivers you. And he's going to lead you to your land of promise. Now, please understand this. What you think is your land of promise and what God says is your land of promise may be two different things. But trust in what the Lord says. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. Hebrews 3.15. So through Jesus, we should never stop offering our sacrifices to God. The sacrifice of praise coming from our lips that speak his name. So here we are. God will never leave you nor forsake you. He's going to bring you out. But you got to praise him. You got to thank him. You got to do some sacrificing for God. You got to offer up your sacrifice. We're not in the Old Testament anymore. So it won't be any animals killed and no blood shed and putting it on the altar because Jesus came for our sacrificial lamb. And he did all of that. But he said, we still have to give the sacrifice of praise. God requires that. So we still have our sacrifices due today. And you know what? We choose to praise God, not only in the good times, but in the bad times. So it's no sacrifice to praise God when everything is going your way and is looking up. But I'll tell you, you don't have money. You lost your job. You put out of your apartment and you don't have any food and your children don't have clothes. It is a sacrifice then to praise God. But you know what? We don't praise God according to what we think. We praise God for who he is understanding God is still the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, and he does not change. Your praise is not dependent on your circumstances, and it's not even, you know, dependent on God's performance, whether he did that for you, or whether he didn't do that for you, or whether you thought he did it quick enough, or he didn't do it at all yet. You just haven't waited long enough. Praise is not a reward. It's something you do because God deserves the praise. And you know what? Real praise comes from an humble heart. And it rises from our heart up to our lips. So that no matter what is causing you pain, just remember, God is good. His mercy is everlasting and he will never leave you nor forsake you. Even if you don't get what you asked for, you prayed for, you fasted for, and it seemed like it's not there yet, he's still good. So let's look at this verse. So in Genesis uh, uh, 28 uh, in verse 15, this is about Jacob. When we know that Esau and Jacob, we know the story of Esau and Jacob and how we say that Jacob stole Esau's birthright, but that may be debatable, but he got the, uh, he, he got the birthright and God honored the birthright. And so let's look. And so Jacob has left because he's fleeing because Esau has threatened to kill him because through trickery, uh, uh, Jacob got the birthright, but Esau gave it up for some food. So, and then, then let's look at each one of these little lines in this verse. And behold, I am with thee. So God is telling Jacob, okay, you out here in this wilderness, you have left. And now you out here going to uh, Haran and uh, to your mother's brother to find a wife because you got to leave. And really, you don't even know if you're ever going to get to come home again or to see your mother again so or your father again. So it's, it's, I'm sure it's a very hard journey. So sometimes, and behold, I'm with you when, you when you're alone. Sometimes we're by ourselves. And sometimes we need to be by ourselves. And sometimes we're distant from our families. Sometimes we don't have friends or anybody to call on. But the presence of God 
is abundant. That's what we have to remember. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. Seek after him. And he says, and will keep thee in all places. All is a big word. That means there's nowhere you could go, nothing that you can do that God won't keep you if you want to be kept. Whether you go as, he will keep you from your enemies. He will keep you in the lonely place. He will keep you from people trying to take over you, trying to tear you down, you know, just mess up your rep reputation. I'll keep you from all of that. He'll keep you from your friends. He'll keep you from your enemies. He'll keep you from your family. And he says, from always being under bondage. So we don't want to be over bondage. The enemy will hold us down and living in bondage. Remember, the Israelites were in bondage. God brought them out. He sees them. He heard them. He delivered them. So remember to always remember God is with us. <clears throat> Excuse me. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken of. That means until he's made good of all his promises, I'm not going to leave you. So <clears throat> as not before, so never after, for God never does nor never will utterly forsake his people. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. That's a huge promise that because God said it, you can take it to the bank. And then he gave us, uh, he will never, that means he, when we say he will never leave us or forsake us, what does that mean? It means that he will never take his presence from us nor his help. But we have to be in, do it according to God's law, not how we think about it or how we think it should be done because we are kingdom citizens and whatever the uh, rules that God has for things to be done, that's the way we don't get to make the rules. We just get to follow the rules and trust God even when we don't understand. So, uh, Moses is sharing with the people now, uh, there's some background here, that he's getting ready to leave them. He's 120 years old, and they've been in this wilderness, and God has already told him, okay, Moses, you're not going into the promised land. And now Moses brings Joshua in, and he calls all the people together and say, okay, God has appointed Joshua to lead you all into the promised land. I'm not going to be with you, but God is going to be with you. And when he said, you can, when you, go, you can go into the promised land and conquer the Hittites, the Canaanites, the Perivites, all of those, the Amorites, then God will still do it. It's not about me. It's about God. So then Joshua now gets to take over leadership. But remember, he has been with Moses for 40 years. So he's had training and he knows what to do. And plus, God has now anointed him to do the job just like he anointed. And I want to tell you, God did something for Joshua the same as he did for Moses. When the Israelites left Israel, God parted the Red Sea so they can go over. And now when Joshua takes the Israelites into the promised land, he parts the Jordan and they walk across on dry land. So God is showing Joshua that I have anointed you to do the work and carry it out just like I did Moses. So in Joshua 1 and 5, and 1, 1 5 and 6, it says, there shall not any man be able to stand before thee in all the days of my life as I was with Moses, I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake you. Bring, be strong and of good courage. For unto this people shall thou then divide the inheritance of the land, which I swear to their fathers to give them. 
So God made a way for Joshua, the same as he did for Moses. And when Joshua, he had to have some wisdom, he had some knowledge. God couldn't leave him because he had to be able to think for all these millions of people, how, and these 12 tribes, how to divide up this land. And remember in Joshua 3.13, it says the priest will carry the holy body, the commandments. He he is the Lord of the whole world. They will carry that box to front in the front of you into the Jordan. When you enter the water, the water of the Jordan will stop flowing and fill behind that place like a dam. So that is the same thing, the same anointing that uh, God had given Moses. He's now given to Joshua. So when you're preparing for a victory and you know that God will never leave you or forsake you, but there's some pre preparations you have to do. And I, there are four types of preparation for victory. One is spiritual. You know, you got to be ready to submit to God, to be obedient to God and to claim his promises and to trust him. And then there's the secret. That's when God tells you to take a risk and he tells nobody but you, but you got to be able to do what he says when the people don't understand and they look at you crazy and you can't say, you can say, well, this is what God did, but they not believe in you, but you got to be in order to have victory. You got to be spiritual. You got to be able to hear God in the secret and do what he say, even if you're terrified and don't understand which way to go. You got to be sensitive. God opened up that pathway through the Jordan, never to show he was with, excuse me, he uh, opened up the Jordan River to show that he was with Joshua as he had been with Moses. God was sensitive to the Israelites, their need for the evidence of his presence, even though they messed up. Time and time and time again, God was sensitive to them. And you know, you got to believe in your heart if you're going to have victory. And we know that Israel, they all had to be circumcised, but you know that we have to do the circumcision of our heart. That is, we got to take away all the uncleanness and all the things that separate us from God and his power. And God is going to be there for you. But you know what? You got to do something in the meantime. Be content. When you think God has left you, be content. When you think it's not going to happen, be content. Trust God. And be content with the things you have or with the present things. Philippians 4 and 11, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatever state I am, therewith to be content. And I can only be content if I know and I understand in my heart, I worship God, I praise God, and I ask for forgiveness, I repent. I know that I can be content while I'm waiting on him. Philippians 4 and 12 says, I know how to be abased and I know how to be abound. Everywhere in all things, I am instructed to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me because I know you never leave me nor forsake me. So what does I know how to be abased mean? You know, sometimes we read scripture, we read these little words and we just skip all over. But, but when we say, I know how to be abased, you know what that means? You know how to humble yourself, to be treated with dignity. When people treat you, well, with dignity, you don't have a problem. But when they treat you with contempt, you got to be humble. When they trample on you, you got to be humble. When you suffer hardship and distress, you got to be humble. So when you're in any kind of low condition that you can think of, 
He got to be humble and minister to his own the necessities of others that way. Yea, to be in hunger, if you're hungry, same thing. If you're cold, if you're naked, if you don't have a place to stay, even through all this, you got to be humble. You got to give God the sacrifice of your lips and understand that he'll never leave you or forsake you. Even when you're depressed and cast down, uh, you just don't know what to do. You seem like you've lost all hope. He'll never leave you or forsake you. Keep that on my, if you can say like Hagar did, when Sarah put her out, God, come see about me. That's all you have to say. And he will be there. And so what does it mean when it says, I know how to abound? That means you know how to excel. You know how to accept the esteem of men. And you know how to have, in the, you know how to act like in plenty. You know how to act when you lift it up. And so we have to understand, we know how to excel. So whatever state you find yourself in, be content knowing that God will never leave you or forsake you with present riches or with poverty, with losses or with crosses. God will never leave you or forsake you. Now, this is a promise that was made to Joshua. It was made to Moses. It was made to David. So we have examples of what God, and even in the New the Hebrew scripture, so we know that God, it just wasn't for the Old Testament. So what's the secret of being satisfied even while you're waiting in, a, in the midst of a storm and believing that God will never leave you or forsake you? It's drawing on Christ's power for strength and God's promises. You have to believe on his power and his promise because it's not by power, it's not by might, but it's by your spirit, says the Lord. So Joshua 1 and 5 says, which may regard things temporal so that God will not leave his people in the hands of the enemies nor forsake them in distress, nor withhold any good thing from them needed that is, that is needful for them, but he will supply them with the, ne the necessities of life, which they should be content. Remember, God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. So, what I want to tell you is this and leave you with this. No matter what state you find yourself in, God is always there. He'll never leave you or forsake you. Now, the enemy will come in and say, see, I told you that nobody didn't like you. I told you you wasn't going to get the job. I told you you wasn't going to get the money, the bank loan. I told you you wasn't going to get the car. Well, and so what? Maybe somebody going to give you a car. Maybe that job wasn't your job. It was a job that's over that job. See, the devil always try to make us think of the negative, but there is no negative in God. So what do you do? The word says in Matthew 6, 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things that you want, need, or desire, they can will be added unto you. But while you're waiting on them, and they're not coming as quick as you think they should or could, remember, God will never leave you or forsake you. I don't care if you wait five years, five months, five weeks, or 50 years. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. And he said, don't take no thought for tomorrow, but tomorrow has, shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day. God. That's why he said in the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, give us this day. That's what he told the disciples to pray. Give us this day our daily.
daily bread. So if you don't feel close to God, guess who moved? Because he'll never leave you nor forsake you. Seek the kingdom of God and the way. Now, when you seek the kingdom of God, that means you are doing that. You're seeking the way God wants you to live according to his rules, his regulations, and be righteous, which means conduct yourself and live like kingdom citizens. So to God be the glory for the things he has done. Remember, God will never leave you or forsake you. No matter what the day brings, keep on praising him because we owe him the praise. We owe him the glory. He wants the sacrifice of your life. Love God with all your heart, your mind, and your soul. Trust him and he will make a way out of no way. So to God be the glory. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope something was said to encourage you and that the Lord will continue to bless you and keep you. And if you like this channel, we ask that if you will, you will subscribe. And if you will leave comments, we will get back with you. Have any questions? If you need Christ in your life, let us know. We'll be glad to lead you to Christ. To God be the glory. You all be blessed and have a wonderful week until the next time. Amen.